Good morning, Mesa. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Thank you, Ken. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. It's a great day to uh, it's a great day to be a father. How's that? We're glad to have our mission team back. We're glad that uh, most of you are recovering and uh, feeling better. So thank you for doing the communion, Robin. And uh, I know a lot of you have had some difficulty with. Uh, the change in uh, climate, uh, so that's one of those things that's a little bit difficult. I wanted to mention again, this Wednesday is going to be our singing week, and so let me encourage you to come for that. You get to learn a new song as well as sing some of the other ones, and so that's a great time just to be able to uh, learn some of the songs that we sing, and especially being able to learn some new ones. So, I found out last week People only listen to about every fifth sentence that I say. (laughs) So, in case you're one of those that was not listening, Curtis is much better. (laughs) All right? So, a little inside. I want to talk about fathers today and about what goes on and about how that comes from God. And so, we're going to start at the very beginning. And the very beginning starts with Adam and Eve. And it talks about creation. It talks specifically about the time when Adam and Eve were created. Now, chapter 1 is a summary. And so if you begin to compare chapter 1 and chapter 2, they don't always match up because chapter 1 is just the summary. It kind of lets you know here's what all happened, but chapter 2 gives you more details. And so as you look at the summary here, He talks about this creation time when God made the earth, and he made it for himself. He didn't make it for us because he looked and he saw and he said, that's good. And we weren't around yet because we're the last thing that he created. And so he looked and saw that it was good. It was his earth. He created it for himself. He's the one that wanted it, and he put us in it. That's a great thing that we got to be in something that he likes, something that he thinks is good. And so it talks about this creation. It's a statement that talks about the animals being created first, and then both male and female, we were created in the image of God. And it says, and God blessed them. And God said, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And he gives them dominion over everything, over all the animals. And he says, I'm going to give you plants for food. And so this is what we've been talking about, which is abundance. How did we get 7 billion people in the world? Goodness, that's a lot of, we kind of went overboard, didn't we? I mean, this be fruitful and multiply seems like, yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of us now. Uh, maybe grouped together in cities and things like that. But this was God's plan, and that's part of what I want you to understand is about this abundance that we've been talking about, the increase of God and how God's able to give this abundant life. And, man, it works with family so much. And so we want to talk about this abundance and Father's Day and about how all of this comes about. It starts with the be fruitful and multiply. There's only two people. Now, why didn't he start with, like, grass? I don't think there was just two blades of grass. There was a lot more blades of grass. But he starts with only two people. And so I think there's some lessons that God wants us to learn from some of these things. So chapter 2 is much more specific about some of the things. 
that he has to say about his creation. So in verse 5, it says, the seeds were planted, but, you know, when nothing was sprouted in the field. And so that's a little different picture than what we think. And we talked about from small to great and how seeds are planted and how God uses this. And certainly you see that in creation. He starts with one person. I know chapter 1 says he created both male and female, and he did. But he starts with one person. So God made Adam out of dust, and he made him in his own image in verse 8. And he was told about the trees in the garden. He was told, I don't want you to eat out of the tree in the middle of the garden. And so he was told about that. And then there was the Garden of Eden that was planted. And then Adam was put into the Garden of Eden. And then, you with me so far? And then he said, it's not good for you to be alone. Kind of the first not good. So did God mess up? Did God say, oh, I should have thought of this before. I I don't think it's quite that way. But he just turns to Adam and after all of this creation and after all of these things that he's done, he says, you know, it's not good for you to be alone. And he's waiting for Adam to realize that. I think that's part of the process here. And let me show you how this is going to work because God's creation is very intentional. He doesn't just accidentally said, well, I think I'll make stuff. No, I think he very much, if you know science and have looked at science, you probably realize there's a lot more to this than what we ever understand and all the microscopic things that are going on around us and it's... It's really incredible when God balances all of this and he says, I want this to work. But he says, it's not good for you to be alone. And so he creates specifically for Adam. First, he does the animals and he's looking for a helper. He says, you know, see if there's one around. You know, dogs are nice. Cats are nice. Well, no, not cats. Snakes are nice. Uh, but there's nothing that fills his heart or fills his soul, and so there isn't anything that's really the helper. He also does not create create another man, because he could have done that. He said, well, you know, how about another one of me, just another buddy? There's some dust over there. He says, no, that's not going to work. That's not what you need. And so as you look at all of this, he talks about this special person that Adam's going to need. God wants Adam to know this person is special. There's not a single other creature in all of the earth that's going to be like them. And it's something that you need and something that fills your heart because nothing else will do that. And so in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs and he closed up its place with that flesh And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. It's an incredible passage, isn't it? How God does this. He says, what could I do that would make this personal with Adam? You know, another pile of dust. Say, let me show you what I can do with this dust. It's not better dust. He says, well, you need some surgery, Adam. And the thing that convinces Adam that this person is so very important is she comes from him. And so... He says, I I don't know if it caused him pain or not. I was going to say it caused him some pain, but I don't know if it did or not. Maybe God had better anesthetic, and and he was just, you know, able to go in and pull out a rib, and it was easy, and I don't know. But he, he puts him to sleep, at least, and so you get the idea that maybe this is a healing process that he has to go through. And he creates Eve. She doesn't look like a rib. He maybe uses the DNA or uses something off of the rib. I'm not sure how he does that, but if he can make a man out of dust, he can make a woman out of a rib. And so 
That's what you see happening here. And he says, this is my bones. This is, this is part of me. My bones and my flesh. And he names her woman. Not God. He's named everything else. He names her woman. And they have this incredible relationship together. And that's what God creates as well. By doing creation this way, he's saying, here's what I want you to understand about all of this. And they're both naked. They're not ashamed to be with each other. Then children come along. Didn't create children at first, right? So Adam becomes the father, Cain, and then Abel, and then Seth, and then a whole bunch more. And so family was formed. Really created, right? He creates family. And and that's how he puts people on the earth. And that's maybe why he started with two. He didn't start with, you know, four lumps of dust and say, well, let me put you guys all together. And you're family now. No, he starts with one guy and he says, I'm going to pull part out of you. And then he takes the woman and he says, I'm going to have children out of you. And I think that's why kids are important to us today and why we really understand that this is important because you carried them for nine months, not the fathers, the mothers. You carry this for nine months. And fathers know, they've taken care of, they understand how this is. And this is ours because we had it. It came out of us. And it is that concept that I think God has of of saying, these people are important to us. And it's the way he has of teaching us. And so abundance in family, that's the first thing. Abundance in family is the fact that God creates family. Okay? He starts there. He didn't create a lot of individuals and say, you guys get along the best you can. He creates family. Two people, then children, And each one comes out of the other. Well, sometimes it works well, doesn't it? And the kids are great, and the parents are great, and then sometimes it doesn't work so well. We're going to assume Adam and Eve did well together. There's not a lot to argue about. They don't have other jobs. They just have the garden, and then, well, there is that problem. They get kind of thrown out of the garden, and so you have to go through hardship together. I don't know what kind of parents they were. Their parenting skills may not have been the greatest. They may have told the kids about worship, but one of them's good and one of them's not so good. Is it because they didn't teach well or because the kid didn't listen well? But Cain isn't very good at at this. And then they have a problem with temper. And they didn't teach kids about temper and about what you're supposed to do there. And one of them kills the other. Well, that's already a bad situation in a family, right? When you've had one that kills the other, it's pretty hard to uh, recognize how this is going to work. But God's creation is all about family. He makes a woman good for him. And you notice when they talk about the tree, especially in Romans, he talks about the sin of Adam. And about the fall, it was Adam's fault, right? But wait a minute, if you go back to chapter 3, you realize there's a problem with that. Because the serpent came to the woman, and it was the woman who ate the fruit first, and then she gave some to her husband, who apparently was standing right there. But it's Adam's sin. It's always Adam's sin. Every reference in the Bible, it's Adam's sin because it was his responsibility. And that's where fathers come in. It's your responsibility. You might look at God and say, well, but my wife, you know what? Even if it was your wife that ate the fruit first, God says it's your sin. You are responsible for it. And that's why Father is so important. Because God has put us in that place. He says, I made you first. It's creation order. 
And I gave you this place, and I gave you this responsibility, and you're supposed to take care of everybody else. Well, along with the blessing and being first is the responsibility. You're supposed to take care of everybody else. And so when you start looking at the way God puts this together and maybe how we need to understand family also, he says this family unit is very, very important because it also is connected with who does right and wrong. His idea is not a multiplying abundance, just have a bunch of people. He says there are other family units. It's not just one big family. It takes a village, right? No, that's our saying. That's wrong. It does take a family. Now, you can have a village, but what God says is it takes a family. And you need to take care of your own kids, your own family. And that's really where the responsibility comes. He does not leave it. There's another place of father here throughout the Old and New Testament, really. And that's the idea of Abraham. When Abraham is asked to move, he is asked to leave his place and to go to a new place, and God makes a promise for him. In Genesis 17, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, and he said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after, the, after you the land of your sojourning, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so this is one of the times when God talks to Abraham and gives him this covenant. He's already told him about the stars of the heaven and how your descendants are going to be greater than the stars of the heaven. And that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of descendants. And then, but Abraham doesn't have a child. But he says, you're going to. And at 99, he comes and makes the statement we've just read. And at 100, he has the child of promise. Did not look possible. Didn't look like there was a way for that to happen. And yet what you see happening is a person of faith. And that's what God was trying to establish. And maybe the picture doesn't always describe it when you start looking at the new happy couple when you give the baby shower for them they've been married a long time they've over a hundred years old what kind of a shower game can you play with them uh, yeah I'm glad I don't have to go to shower so but this is incredible to realize that Abraham never stopped believing this all the way through. He was 75 at the first promise. Now at 100, they finally have the baby. And they say, this is great. I get to be a father at 100. Wow, what an amazing thing. And Abraham is father of a lot of people. He's father of the Jews. In fact, all the way through the Old Testament, it is Father Abraham. I could have had Steve lead the song. I can't lead the song because there's a lot of jumping and stuff. But uh, you always see this, Father Abraham. Well, why? He wasn't their father. Grandfather. Great-grandfather. Great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. And it just gets worse after that. I mean, there's so many times. So he's in our father, but he's a father. They always talk about father because they're not talking about biology. They're talking about faith. 
because he is a father to people of faith. And God said, this is to be for you and for your offspring after you. That's the reason that he says it. He makes a covenant with them. In Genesis 22, we see that faith being tested again. When God says to him, I want you to take your child of promise and I want you to sacrifice him to me. What kind of education had Abraham given to his son? Had he taught him about God? How old is he? All the pictures that you get with this picture Isaac as being young, right? This is one of the few that shows what's really the case. Who carries the wood? It's not Abraham. (laughs) It's Isaac. Because he's the young, strong one, and so he's probably in his 20s at least. And he's the one carrying the wood, and he's the one who knows about it. And when he asks his father about, well, where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide. And then he's got to explain, well, why don't I just, you know, tie you up for a little bit? Let me let you just lay down on this altar for a little bit. No, it's not an accident at all. He has to explain to his son, here's what it means to be faithful to God. And if you'll trust God... I trust God, but right now you're going to be the sacrifice to him. How do you teach that kind of faith? To where Isaac would say, okay, I trust that God spoke to you because Isaac never has heard it. I believe in you enough, Dad, that I'll lay on the altar And I'll give you the knife. Because I believe in God enough to realize God's able to do anything. God's able to do everything. It's how I got here. And if it's God's will, then after this sacrifice, resurrection is possible. I don't know how they made that jump. But that's what they did. It was a man of faith who had raised a child of faith and taught his child about faith and about what that means. And so the second thing is it's not just a family, it's a faithful family. That they understand what God's about, that they understand what faith means. It doesn't always work. We've already been through Cain. I mean, you know that sometimes... Kids do what kids want to do, and they don't always follow what parents teach them. And maybe it's parents didn't teach well, and maybe it's kids didn't learn well. I don't know. But I know that it takes a lot to raise a child of faith. And this father becomes a father of faith because of so many people that he's around. In Deuteronomy 6, as you begin to look at What Moses did when he brings the people out and they're about to go into Canaan, he says, parents, I want you to teach your children. I want you to be sure as you go along, as you sit, as you walk, as you shop, as you do whatever you do, I want you to make sure that you teach your children who God is and what God's all about. This was not just to fathers, this was to parents both. And sometimes it worked really well. And so you get people like David, who's able to use the power of God to do so much, and Jehoshaphat, who's a great king, and sometimes they were faithful, and sometimes they didn't teach their kids, and they didn't continue to keep their law, and so family may have continued, but it wasn't always a faithful family. And when family isn't faithful, then they don't always stay together and you get more the condition we have today. But they came to depend on Father Abraham and who he was and on that promise that all nations would be blessed through him and that there would be this one descendant at the end and there would be this one person who allowed them to have this land and to have this great blessing from God. And they came to count on that because after all, we're biological descendants of Abraham. And he is our 
father. Father in faith is what they meant. Yes, there's a biological connection, but it's really removed in some cases. But God wasn't finished. If that was the end of the story, we would be in trouble, wouldn't we? But God is not finished yet. He wants a place for everybody. And so, with the coming of Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham, son of God, he is that blessing. He is the one who was promised. He is the one who is there. And he is one of those kids who was taught about faith in God. His family goes to synagogue. He participates in the worship. We know that because he stands up to read. His family went to the feast. They made the travels to the feast every year at Pentecost. And so they were people who were heavily involved in worshiping God and in doing things with God. And they was taught about this faith. And I imagine his mom and his dad both had explained to him about the conditions of his birth. And what an incredible thing that is to be the promised child of Abraham, but also to realize, you know what, the system God set in place so many, many years before in the garden with Adam and Eve is, teach your kids. It worked with Jesus. And it works with you today. It works all the way through. And as we look at this promise and what we are and who we are, we can think about the time when, when God realizes and fulfills this promise. In Galatians chapter 3, he's talking about sons of Abraham and what this promise means and what it's all about. He says, know then that, those who are, that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, God had this from the beginning. He said, here's what it's going to take. Somewhere, there's not going to be descendants biologically of Abraham, and it's going to be people who are not Jews. That's most of us. Not Jews. Gentiles. How do we have a place? How do we fit? How can we ever be in there? And so he promised to Abraham there will be a descendant that will bless all nations. That descendant was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ comes and dies on a cross for all nations so that all nations might be blessed. It's God's plan from the beginning. Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham, in other words, who have this promise, and that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And that faith becomes critical to us because we have no other way. We have no birthright. We have no blood right. We have only faith. That's really all there is. So abundant family really comes from faith. And you add the third one. Abundant is a faithful spiritual family. Because that's all I can have. I don't know about you, but I can't have the biological. I'm, I'm not Jewish. But I can have the promise of Abraham by the Spirit. And that's what we're able to have today because of this great promise that he was given, that one child would bless all the earth. It's what John talked about as Jesus was coming. In John chapter 1, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so Jesus was this. He was that true light who's coming into the world. He made made the world. He created it all, and yet the world didn't accept him. They rejected him. But there are some people who did. And those people who believed in him and who received him, God gave the right to become children of God because they were born of God. 
They had the same faith as Abraham. They had that kind of faith that says, you know what, we're willing to sacrifice anything. We're willing to sacrifice anything, right? Right? Yeah, that's a harder nod, isn't it? Uh, maybe. <laughs> but that's what it takes to be a child of faith like Abraham and do what Abraham did and to live like Abraham lived and all of these things it seems to us that you know God has this great way of making us his children not from biology but being born of a new birth John 3 describes this being born of the water and the spirit and how we are immersed in baptism and the water and the spirit raised to walk a new life when we believe in Jesus Christ so much that we say we understand you are the child of promise you are the one that God said because we are people of faith and we accept that family and we accept all of this together and so the whole Bible comes together and at one central point when you start talking about father because it's Father God, it's Father Abraham, it's Father's here today, and all of us are still working on, one th on the same thing, that we are people of God who live by this faith and we pass this faith to our children. What an incredible thing it is to realize all of this, that God's abundance makes family possible and makes all of these things possible. So abundant family is not just about blood or birth. It's about the blood of Christ and being born of God. And the best news of all with this is when you get to the end of this, you get to be father on Father's Day. And you get to have a whole lot of kids. A whole lot of spiritual kids. I got a lot of kids here, some of you know. If you walk by Vince McNeil, he will say, Hi, brother. I assume we're related. We are in the Lord. And there's a whole lot of those brothers and sisters. Why? Because we've been made into a spiritual family. Because we have all these relationships. And so there's times when you don't have to go through all that process of you can borrow a kid. You can have a kid. You can say, because this is my spiritual child, I have this connection. Because of Jesus Christ, he died for us. And you're, you're my child. You're my brother. You're my sister. And so all of these family relationships are so great to be able to have. And when you start talking about abundant life and abundant things that God's able to give, not just the increase, but the increase of relationships is so huge and so big and so amazing. He makes all of us able to connect and all of us able to be part of God and all of us able to have this kind of relationship and have this kind of family. The greatest thing about being fathers, you can have both. You can have your own kids and then you can have your spiritual kids, your kids of faith, and you get to be grandpa all over again. And there's nothing better than grandchildren. Yeah, my kids already know that, so you can tell them that. And the abundance is in the abundance of relationships in the abundance of love and the fellowship and the blessing that you have, and it's all yours. So let me just ask you this morning, do you have that? Do you have those relationships with people that are relationships of faith? Because that's the Bible. The whole thing is about that. That's what it is all intended to be. And if you want to, I guess we'll take a rib out of you and say, okay, now we really can't make another person. But God makes people join together. If you don't have that, let me encourage you to, boy, get into this. Be born of God in the water and the spirit so that you're able to have these kind of relationship. It is fantastic to have all of this and realize this comes from an abundant God.
If we can help you with that, please come while we stand and sing. Ladies only.